learning class today we will begin with a new lesson photosynthesis as you can see the word photosynthesis is derived from two words photo means light and synthesis means to make you've been studying about photosynthesis right from your junior school and you know that it is a process by which plants prepare their food now four raw materials are needed for this process first carbon dioxide then water and two conditions are required chlorophyll and sunlight now what is the significance of this process the plant benefits itself also and nature also by this process photosynthesis provides food for all you will find that every green plant is able to carry out this process and manufacture its own food and we are all directly or indirectly dependent on these green plants so we have studied about food chain and you know that every food chain begins with a green plant so photosynthesis is the food providing process it provides food to everybody on this earth the second significance is it provides oxygen which is released into the atmosphere and it is the main gas needed for respiration so if you are asked that why tiger owes its existence to chlorophyll and give reasons you are asked so two things you have to write in that first that it provides food because chlorophyll is the main component needed for photosynthesis and all green plants have it only green plants have it so it provides food to all because it's the starting point of every food chain chlorophyll because it's the imp most important ingredient and secondly it provides oxygen to all and we all need both food and oxygen for our survival so in short we can say that chlorophyll is the basis of survival on this earth and so is the process photosynthesis now let's talk about the green pigment chlorophyll basically chlorophyll is of nine types but the two main types are chlorophyll a and b and chemically chlorophyll is composed of carbon hydrogen oxygen nitrogen and magnesium magnesium is the main metallic component here and chlorophyll has a porphyrin ring and in the center of the ring magnesium is present now this chlorophyll pigment is present inside a very important plastid called the chloroplast you can see a chloroplast here now where exactly is the chlorophyll present now in this chloroplast you can see some disk like structures here which are the thylakoids now inside these thylakoids or to be more specific in the membrane of these thylakoids this chlorophyll pigment is present whose primary role is to absorb the sun's energy or sunlight in the form of photons so thylakoid membrane consists of chlorophyll pigment which is of nine types but two main important ones are chlorophyll a and b then how is this chlorophyll chlorophyll arranged in the thylakoid membrane it is arranged in the form of units called quanta zones around approximately 240 to 50 chlorophyll molecules together make up a quanta zone which absorbs one quantum of solar energy in the form of photons these thylakoids are piled up in a stack just like when we collect copies you submit them we place them one over the other like a pile this whole pile is called the grana so if it comes for labeling and you have to label an individual disk the individual disk is the thylakoid and the entire stack is the grana coming to other parts of chloroplast chlorophylls uh, arrangement is clear to you i believe now we'll move on to the structure of the chloroplast chloroplast as you know is present only in plant cells this chloroplast is a double membranous plastid you can see an outer membrane and an inner membrane and here you know that these are the thylakoids which are arranged as grana these grana are interconnected by intergranal lamellae or commonly what we call as or refer to as frets and this entire area is filled with matrix which is called stroma so we'll talk about two main phases in the next class of photosynthesis light reaction and dark reaction and there we'll study that it is the grana 
or the thylakoid which is the site for light phase or light reaction and it is the stroma which is the site for dark reaction. Next we will talk about the importance of sunlight in making or destroying this chlorophyll which is present inside the chloroplast. So sunlight is needed for production of chlorophyll but at the same time too much sunlight destroys this chlorophyll. So excess of everything is bad and so is sunlight bad for chlorophyll. Now if you must have noticed in your garden, if some potted plant is kept on the grass of your garden and you lift up that potted plant after a couple of weeks, you will find that the grass in that patch has turned yellow because when no sunlight was there, no new chlorophyll was produced. So for chlorophyll formation, sunlight is important. Otherwise, it leads to a phenomena called etiolation. Etiolation means yellowing of leaves, which you all must have noticed. If you keep a brick or place a brick on your garden grass and lift it up after 15 days, you will find an etiolated patch there because chlorophyll production required sunlight and grass didn't get sunlight for some days. Likewise, if too much chlorophyll is given, then also the plant gets burnt out, chlorophyll gets destroyed. So an optimum amount of continuous sunlight is needed for chlorophyll production and maintenance. Our next topic is how stomata regulate their opening and closing by changing their turgidity levels or by changing from turgid to flaccid or vice versa. Now we all know that stomata are present on the surface of the leaf. Now it is wrong to say that stomata are present on the lower surface. Most of the time we say stomata are present on the lower surface. Leaves are of two kinds, dorsiventral and isobilateral. A dorsiventral leaf is that which has more stomata on the lower side. Most of the leaves around you are dorsiventral of dicotyledonous plants. But isobilateral has equal number of stomata on both surfaces. So if you are asked the location of stomata, you need to say that they are present on surface of the leaf, both in the upper and lower epidermis. But yes, in a dorsiventral leaf, they are more in number on the lower surface. Now here is the structure of stomata, what it appears like during day and how it appears at night time. Let's take a good look at its structure first. Each stomata consists of a pair of bean shaped cells which are called guard cells. Each guard cell has an inner thick wall. This is the concave wall. So inner concave wall is thick and outer wall is thin. Now there is an opening left here which is called the stoma. So opening of stomata is called stoma. Each guard cell has a nucleus like any plant cell, has lots of chloroplasts and is filled with cytoplasm. It is surrounded by some irregularly shaped cells which are called subsidiary cells. Now let's see what happens during day. Now during daytime, these guard cells take up water from the surrounding subsidiary cells. We have talked about a process called endosmosis in the lesson absorption. So guard cells by endosmosis or by osmosis take up water from the surrounding subsidiary cells. When water enters into these guard cells, it exerts more pressure on the outer thin wall as compared to the inner thick wall. And so this outer wall becomes more bulging or convex and the inner thick walls are drawn apart. The stoma opens. This is what is happening during daytime. And what is the state of guard cells? They have become turgid during daytime due to endosmosis. Reverse happens at nighttime. These guard cells lose their turgidity. They lose their water to the surrounding subsidiary cells, give it back to them and as they do so, they turn flaccid. When they turn flaccid, the inner thick walls are drawn close to each other and the stoma closes. So during daytime, the guard cells open. During nighttime, they become closed. Very few diagrams are asked from this lesson, but the ones made on the blackboard right now are both important or all three are important for drawing as well as for labeling. So you need to practice how to draw and label. Moreover, opening and closing of stomata is also asked as a full descriptive question. 
Now there are two theories regarding this opening and closing of stomata because of course it had to be thought that why in the daytime the guard cells are taking up water, why in the night time they are losing water, there must be a change in the osmotic concentration. So two theories are proposed. The first theory is the potassium ion theory. According to the potassium ion theory, the guard cells which have chloroplasts, as you can see there are a number of chloroplasts, with the aid of these chloroplasts trap solar energy and perform the process of photosynthesis during daytime. Now when they prepare the food, the energy which is released is stored in the form of ATP. This ATP is used to pump in potassium ions from the surrounding subsidiary cells into the guard cells. So during daytime, guard cells are doing photosynthesis, producing energy. Energy is being stored in the form of ATP. And this ATP pumps potassium ions. This is the first theory or potassium ion theory. Pumps potassium ions from the surrounding cells into the guard cell. Now potassium ions would raise the osmotic concentration of the guard cells. As this happens, the inner medium becomes hypertonic. Now you all know what happens when inside would become hypertonic, outer medium is hypotonic. So water will move from a hypotonic medium to a hypertonic medium. The guard cells become turgid and stoma opens. In the night time, all energy has been used up. So now potassium ions start leaking back. Now when they leak back from the guard cells to the surrounding cells, what would happen? Inner osmotic concentration falls. Medium becomes hypotonic, outer medium becomes hypertonic. So now water moves from inside to outside, guard cells become flaccid and stoma closes. Now this is one theory or one set of scientists believe this. The other theory is the sugar concentration theory. We all know that during photosynthesis, glucose is the main end product formed. So one set of people believe that it is this glucose which is formed there in the guard cells which raises the osmotic concentration, makes the inside medium hypertonic, helps to draw up water by endosmosis and is responsible for turgidity of guard cells. Whereas in the night time we know that first in daytime sugar couldn't be translocated, it gets converted to starch. And in night time or evening time, when sun is down, then phloem translocates that sugar. It reconverts it back into glucose and translocates it. So when in evening time or night time, the sugar gets translocated, again the osmotic concentration inside falls and now the inside medium becomes hypotonic and outside medium becomes hypertonic. So water starts moving out by the process of exosmosis and due to that the guard cells turn flaccid and stoma closes. So this is how during day and night opening or closing of stomata occurs. If you are asked to explain the mechanism of opening or closing of stomata in the exams, you have to support it with the diagram and you have to propose any theory. If you are not asked to spe specifically which theory, you can explain potassium ion theory or sugar concentration, either of the two, not both, and support it with these diagrams. So this is about stomatal regulation, opening or closing of stomata. And now we will continue on later with the mechanism of the process of photosynthesis.